Hi, Terry Shaneyfeld for UAB School of Medicine. When a meta-analysis is undertaken, all the studies are combined and a common outcome measure is reported. In this video, I'll describe the different types of outcome measures that are commonly used in systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So first, let's talk about the outcomes of treatment type studies. And they can be of two types. They can be dichotomous, which is yes, no outcomes, like people were dead or they were alive. Or they can be continuous, which are outcomes that can occur along a continuum, uh, something like blood pressure. So first, let's look at dichotomous outcomes. And they can be summarized using odds ratios, relative risks, or risk differences. And these measures are interpreted the same way as they would be interpreted and used in the primary studies. Now, continuous outcomes can be summarized in one of two ways. Let's first focus on the mean difference. So if the outcome measure is the same in each study, and it's measured the same exact way, the results can be average, and we can calculate a mean difference. And it measures the absolute difference between the mean value in the two groups in the clinical trial. And it just estimates the amount by which the experimental intervention changes the outcome on average compared with the control group. Now over here with the standardized mean difference, if the outcome measure is the same, but it's measured differently in the individual studies, then we want to calculate something called a standardized mean difference. And sometimes this is called an effect size, though we prefer a standardized mean difference. And we need to standardize the results of each of the individual studies to a uniform scale so that we can combine them. They can't be all measured using different scales because then we couldn't combine them. It wouldn't make any sense. So this formula sort of shows us how we can calculate the standardized mean difference. We'll have a difference in mean outcomes between the groups and we divide it by the standard deviation. Now this can be a little bit different to inter difficult to interpret because it's reported in units of standard deviation, not the units of the measurement scales used in the studies. So that can be a little bit confusing. So for example, the standardized mean difference of 0.5 means that the average effect of treatment across studies is one half of a standard deviation unit. That's kind of confusing. But what I've shown here is how we can interpret the importance of that standardized mean difference. So if the standardized mean difference is 0.2 or less, it's really a pretty small effect. If it's 0.5, it's a moderate effect. If it's 0.8 or greater, that's a pretty large effect. Now these two forest plots are from two systematic reviews to demonstrate some of these measurements. So the top plot up here looked at the effect of cardioselective beta blockers versus placebo on FEV1s. And so in all these studies, it was measured the FEV1 was measured in the exact same way. Therefore, we can use a mean difference. And it's a weighted mean difference here because most meta-analyses weight um, individual studies. Um, and so it results in a weighted mean difference. But it's the same thing as that mean difference. So you can see here this is non-significant because the conference interval here crosses the line of no difference. And the weighted mean difference is 2.39 or the way we'd interpret this is the cardioselective beta blockers insignificantly reduced FEV1 on average by 2.39% more than placebo. Now down here in the, the bottom is a systematic review of the effects of low molecular weight heparin compared to unfractionated heparin in medical patients on venous thromboembolism prophylaxis looking at the outcome of death. And so death is a dichotomous outcome. You either are dead or you're not. So it's appropriate to use a risk ratio or relative risk to summarize um, these individual studies. And finally, this is a forest plot of the effects of calcium supplementation on bone density published in the BMJ a few years ago. The outcome is the same in all these studies. So it's bone density, but it was measured differently. So in this case, because the individual measures of the same outcome are different, we have to calculate a standardized mean difference. And that's what these authors did. And you can see here at the bottom, the effect of calcium supplementation on the standard was a standardized mean difference of 0.14. And if you remember back to that last slide, any standardized mean difference or effect size of 0.2 or less is a small effect. So calcium had a very small effect um, on bone mineral density. 
And finally, to be complete, we can do meta-analysis or systematic review of diagnostic test studies. And these are some of the measures that will be used in those types of studies, the things that we commonly know about, sensitivity and specificity and likelihood ratios. Again, they're interpreted the same way they would be in the primary studies. And then here's another newer term, a summary ROC curve or receiver operator characteristic curve, which looks at the uh, trade-offs between sensitivity and specificity, and it plots sensitivity versus one minus specificity at a variety of cutoff points. So these are different ways that diagnostic test summary um, studies can be uh, combined with a meta-analysis, and these are the outcome measures that would be used. I hope this video has helped you understand how to interpret common outcome measures used in systematic reviews. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the course website or through the contact me section of my blog. Have a great day.